So John, thank you for taking the time to come on today and have this conversation. Uh, I understand you're, you're very much into shamanism, meditation, mindfulness, and, and different types of meditative practices. So I thought it would be very in line with a lot of the people that listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube or, or Instagram. Uh, so just to kick things off, do you mind introducing yourself? What it is you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What it is you're involved with? So I'm a traditional healer from South Africa, and we are also known as Sangwamas. So a Sangwama is a spirit doctor, and in the West you'd call us traditional shamans. And um, it's quite a long process in becoming a, a Sangwama. It's a long apprenticeship, and you also receive a calling, which is quite difficult. So it's quite a long story. So what I do is I teach people how to connect with their spirit, how to connect with their soul. And I also teach people how to connect with their, their ancestors. And what we talk about in South Africa is Ubuntu, Ubunzulu. So I teach people how to connect with their humanity, with their human spirit. So that is like the essential path of traditional shamanism around the world. The first thing is you help people connect with their spirit, with their soul. And then you help people connect with their own spirits, their ancestors, with nature spirits, with the guardian spirits, and also with the animal world, the animal spirits. But first, it starts with the individual, with you and me. First, the person has to connect with their own spirit, their own soul. And often that is actually the hardest for people. It's easier for people to, and it's more fun, you could say, for people to connect with uh, the spirit of the wolf or the spirit of the bear or, you know, some of these kind of glamorous ideas. Um, however, it's not authentic if a person is not really connecting with themselves. So the first is for people to respect themselves and connect with their own spirit. And like I said, it's hard for people because people are so distracted nowadays and we have these lovely iPhones and, and smartphones and there's so many distractions out there and the world is so exciting. And when people have grief and sadness, the first thing people want to do is get distracted. And that's when it's a, it's a, pivot, it's a pivotal moment for people to actually come inside themselves and actually feel their own spirit and their own soul. Because that's, that's where all the juice is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I, I it was reading this study that a lot of people, when they are feeling grief, sadness, and, and various feelings, they actually tend to go to their pets for to be consoled rather than going to yeah. someone else or rather than doing that inner work but they just go to their pets because it's just they're the most loving natural and it has and it is an animal as well which is wonderful so um it's it's interesting how you say that because there is so much external stimuli with all the different technologies and everything that if someone's feeling that way in a lot of cases I, i'm even hesitant to recommend things like meditation apps and, and that because i feel that it's just more immersing them into the te technologies rather than allowing them just to work with their own, their heartbeat or their breath or, you know, um, in Zen, if you just sit and uh, just enjoy natural great perfection, you can, you can start to become one with all those things. So um, it's very interesting how you, how you mentioned technology and information because it is, a, it is a big distraction. But do you mind just uh, getting into a little bit of how you received that calling? And I know that you had gone through some illness prior to that. I believe it was around seven years of uh, different types of fevers and illnesses, and you were having some nightmares and, and whatnot. So it was the turning point when you, when you received that calling, and, and how did that all unfold for you? Yes, um, the turning point happened when, when, when I actually met my teacher in the rural areas of South Africa and the Eastern Cape. And she's part of, um, she's Kosa, and she's part of Nelson Mandela's tribe. And um, so that's when the turning point really happened for me. But in terms of the calling, the calling I received is, is part of what you could say the transpersonal or shamanic, traditional shamanic calling or kundalini calling that is found all over the world, um, especially in traditional cultures, but it's also found with Western people like you and me. And what that calling really is, is, is the way I experienced it was you're getting very, very sick in terms of my 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 nervous system getting very, um, very sensitive. But what also happened alongside that was this becoming very, very psychic, very, very, like getting lots of dreams, getting a lot of visions and being visited by, you could say, a spirit world and, um, and then waking up with all kinds of information, but not being able to absorb it properly because I'm always between the two worlds. I was between the world of 
of the spirit world. And then in this world, the physical world, I was starting to get very, very sick and, uh, and very ungrounded. So part of the training when you find a teacher, um, a Sangoma or a traditional shamanic teacher, part of the training is they do initiations and they do ceremonies and their whole job is to help strengthen the, the spirit of the person so that they can handle these downloads of information, so they can handle these, these spiritual, um, the, the, the spiritual information that's coming to them. And, and I didn't have that opportunity in the early days because being a white guy and, and, and being a, living in apartheid South Africa, I was not allowed to work with, uh, with black people because it was against the law. And I would have been imprisoned or, or taken to jail or something. You know, it was very serious. So I had to wait for apartheid to end in order for me to go and find a, find a teacher. And that's what I did. However, I came very close to death because what happens with this training or with this calling, it's very, very physical. As you become very, very psychic, your physical body gets very compromised and you get very weak. So it's almost like the energy that's going to be going into your physical body to help you to move around and not get flus and colds and things like that. That energy goes into the spirit, uh, the spirit body. So I was becoming more and more psychic. And the more psychic I became, the more my immune system was compromised and the more I was open to all kinds of illnesses. So I had glandular fever, I had hepatitis, I had all kinds of illnesses because my immune system was severely compromised. So when I finally met my teacher, she, she did a number of ceremonies to help strengthen my spirit and strengthen that connection with, with my physical body and the spirit body. And this is all part of traditional shamanic um, indigenous healing. And that's why I, um, I speak about this around the world and how important it is for us to respect and honor and learn from indigenous healing practices. And what was it, what's an example of one of those ceremonies that, that was being applied as a, as a healing modality? Well, it's hard to explain, but I can just uh, just say in a simple way, part of the ceremony is, or part of the magic of the ceremonies is that I'm, um, well, my teacher is part of an unbroken tradition that goes back for hundreds and probably thousands of years. And what she would do, she'd call on this, her spirits, she'd call on her ancestors, and she'd also call on, on my ancestors. And she'd basically call and invoke the spirits into my body and also... Um, there's also very powerful, um, you could say, electrical energy that happens for someone who's, who's had that uh, energy transmitted to them. So she had this in her body that had been passed on to her from her teacher and their teacher and going on back in time. And it was like this transmission of energy that was given to me. And at the same time, what she did was she grounded the spiritual energy. So in South Africa, the healers are very, um, you know, we've got earth medicine. So so it helps to ground that electrical energy. So if you think about, if you think about um, electricity, electricity has to have three different points. And one of the most important points, electricity, it has to be grounded and it has to be earthed. And if electricity is not earthed, it becomes very unstable in a, in a, in a, in a, in a building. And, um, and so the same thing with a human being. If we are not earthed, and grounded, then the electrical systems in our body can become quite unstable. And we see that in the world all around us nowadays. But when you start getting this Kundalini awakening, which is what I was experiencing, it's a, it's a Kundalini awakening. And um, it's quite scary because you get all this energy and that compromises your nervous system and your immune system. So what she did, my teacher, she helped to ground this electrical energy in my body and, and she did this through ceremonies, we did it through dancing, she also did it through plant medicine where she washed my body with different kinds of plants. And the washing of the body with different kinds of plant medicine was able to help ground my body. And then calling on the ancestors to come into me and strengthen me helped. And then also she taught me how to pray. And she also said to me um, that I needed to accept my calling. So the first thing she says, do you want to become a Sangoma? And I said to her, I didn't know what a Sangoma was. So she said, well, a Sangoma is a healer, someone who works with the ancestors. And, and once you accept the calling, you're going to stop being so sick 
and you're going to be able to heal people in all different ways because the spirits are going to be moving through you. The ancestors are going to move through you. Now, you have to understand, I was brought up in, this, in the 80s in South Africa during apartheid, and Sangomas were demonized as witch doctors, and they weren't understood. So you have to, you have to understand the, the cultural milieu of South Africa at that time. So when I said to her, what is a Sangoma, it was because all the information that was given to me about Sangomas I knew was not correct. So when she said to me, a Sangoma is a healer, and I'm going to be able to heal people in different ways. Um, I thought, yeah, that made sense. I, I could trust her. I could trust her words. I looked into her eyes and I saw this light and I trusted her implicitly because in that divination she gave me, she spoke about the last seven years of my life and she had just met me and she was completely accurate and completely bang on um, in terms of the truth of that. Um, now, one, one other thing she said to me was that once you accept your calling, you're going to stop being so sick. And at that stage, I had very weak knees and I was struggling with pain in my knees. So she said, your knees are going to come right. Don't worry about that. So this all felt a bit like a dream, but there was something I trusted about what she was saying. So I said to her, um, okay, I, I will accept this calling. And she says, okay, wonderful. So you'll become my apprentice. And tomorrow, I'd like you to come back to my house and I will give you your first white beads, which is these beads here. And she says, the first, these first white beads will be a sign of, of, um, of you becoming my apprentice and a sign that you've accepted the calling so that the spirits and the ancestors can see this. So after that, things started changing for me quite rapidly. I started to gain weight, whereas before that I was very skinny and very sickly. Um, I started to get a certain energy come into me I started to get a lot more grounded. And um, so that was, uh, so that's what happened to me. So it was a number of different things, but um, a core part of it was also accepting my calling and accepting it in a ceremonial way with my teacher and her community witnessing it. Mm -hmm. So what do you find, uh, in your opinion, what is it that would cause an ungroundedness in an individual? So it's basically to cause that system, that electrical system, to be thrown off. Because from birth, they, they, come, they come into, into being, well, from, from uh, in our world anyways. And, and what do you think it is that, that leads to that imbalance that, that happens in a lot of people's lives and then leads to illness? And I ask because a lot of people I've spoken to, very similar type of stories in terms of they, they encounter a lot of illness, autoimmune issues and they slowly start to take the steps necessary to reverse and, and start to invoke a natural healing within themselves. Mm. I'm just wondering what your opinion is of why you think things go so awry for, for a lot of people. I think um, in my particular case, it was um, the shamanic calling. And sometimes it looks like other illnesses, but where the shamanic calling is different is with all the psychic information that happens at night. That's what makes it different. However, nowadays, in terms of people getting sick, I've seen a lot of illness. And, um, and one of the reasons is because people are separating themselves from nature and they're spending their days in these very, very highly charged electrical fields. So people are spending their days um, on computers. They're spending their days on iPhones, on smartphones. And so they're spending their time in very charged electrical environments, and they are separating themselves more and more from nature, so they are not grounding themselves naturally. They're not taking their shoes and socks off and walking on the earth. They're not spending time looking at birds and sitting under trees. They're spending their free time, again, on their devices, which is exciting. I mean, I love my iPhone as well. However, it's, it's, it's like... Um, it's a bittersweet friend. You have to be careful because of the electrical energy that comes with, with the cyberspace and with the internet. We have, to also, we have to also ground and earth ourselves because like I said about any electrical system, if you don't earth the system, it becomes unstable. And so this is what's happening to a lot of human beings. They're becoming unstable just in a physical way because they are not grounding themselves. They're not earthing themselves. So interesting things would happen to me when I'd go on tour. 
and I'd play my drum and sing and get everyone to dance. And um, I remember doing this in New York City. I just arrived and I did, a, I did a talk and a demonstration and then I played my drum and I got people to meditate and then I got people to get up and start dancing. And a few of the people in the group actually had phenomenal dreams. They had phenomenal dreams afterwards where they connected with their ancestors and they had all these like incredible experiences. And one of the reasons why I felt it happened is because, because of this, this very earthy drum beat that I'm, I'm playing and getting people to dance with their feet on the ground, they got earthed. The people literally got earthed and they got grounded. So those dreams that they're meant to receive, they received because their bodies got earthed. So it wasn't necessarily anything that I was doing that was special. It was the technique that I was using, this ancient technique to earth the people, to ground them. And then they received their natural born gifts in terms of their dreams and the information that, um, the information that their ancestors wanted to give to them. Mm -hmm. So that's the magic of it. All people have to do is spend a little bit more time in nature, take their shoes and socks off sometimes, and turn their phones off or put them in their bags and just look at the squirrels, just look at the birds, just put your hands on the ground and go for a walk and let go. And that should be enough to actually start stabilizing the nervous system. Hmm. And, I, and I know from listening to some of uh, your work and even just reading your book that you're, you're into some Buddhist practices as well, or, or a lot of what you do is like that. And, and you mentioned some Zen practices. So when you say going in nature, uh, it hits home for me. That's one of the practices I really uh, like to employ. I, I actually will go walking in nature. I do the barefoot to grounding and earthing techniques. Um, mm -hmm. I like watching treetops sway. It's something that's very easy for me to just get lost in that alone. Uh, sky gazing, which I've spoken with Lama Surya Das about in, in previous episodes. Um, so I think nature is, is a really strong healing modality. Uh, I want to ask you about your drumming technique because I, I've, I've gone a little bit into that as well myself. And... Um, what do you think it is that the specific aspect of drumming that, that brings people into that state of, of resonance of, for healing? Um, well, with the drumming, it's, it's largely because people can let go and relax. You know, their minds aren't, their minds don't have an agenda. Their minds aren't in the dualism of good and bad or liking and disliking. And I think when our minds are in that dualism, then we're creating karma, we're creating situations for ourselves and for others. But when there's the drumming, there's just that sense of exhalation, just like, just that exhalation. When there's good drumming and you relax into it, you let go, you know, you surrender. And that's when the, the magic starts happening. That's when the visions happen because you don't have an outcome. You don't, you're not stuck in that mental state of dualism, of creating karma. <laughs> You're just becoming very receptive then and just sort of just going with the flow of it. And I suppose it just takes the mind away. It distracts the mind from all of its sort of TikTok, you know, circular uh, way of logic. So that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I actually, it was um, an author, and I believe he's uh, a shaman as well, Michael Tellinger, if, I, if I'm remembering that name correctly. Mm. Uh, but he has some really good stuff around uh, drumming and even on YouTube, a 15-minute drum meditation that uh, sometimes I like to play, and, and I really enjoy it. I'll do like a closed eye meditation, and, and I've seen like fractals and all sorts of visuals with my eyes closed while I'm completely sober, but just listening to this drum beat, uh, I find it to be very effective. Um, so I wanted to ask you about dreaming in particular, because you had mentioned that a lot of these people that when they've gone to your workshops or done some of these, um, uh, you know, dancing around and chanting and, and whatnot, that they start to receive these dreams. And uh, is it much like lucid dreaming in a way where you'll, you'll have these dreams come in and then, um, and I've spoken with a psychologist as well on this podcast, a Jungian psychologist that uh, focuses on dream interpretation. So a lot of what you describe, it seems very similar to that as well. So is it that people just, I suppose, they have these blockages and these dreams aren't flowing through and that then when they do, they're able to now sort of dissect those and analyze them and then, and then bring that into their waking state? No, I won't quite put it like that. I, I'd, I'd like to use different language with dreams. And, and I think that's where we need to move as a human race towards more of a soulful connection with the dreams. So that's, that's the way I work with dreams. I work with dreams in a transpersonal, soulful way. 
And what that means is like when I said in the beginning about my work is about helping people to connect with their spirit, with their soul. And that is that place of immortality inside of them, that part of them that, that they connect to when, 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 they, when they die and that part of them they connect with. We say it's that place um, going beyond life and death. That's what we say in Zen. So it's that part, that relationship that people have to connect with. And nowadays it's very difficult because of Facebook and social media. People are more connected to their personality or their egos than they are to their souls. And this is where we're having all these problems and also where people are becoming disconnected with the environment and with nature. And it's largely because people are, are connecting more with their personality and their egos than they are with that part of them that doesn't die, their, their soul, that immortality. So when people are grounded and they're connecting to a rhythm where there's no good and bad and there's no opinion and people just let go, and often this happens through chanting or dancing, then the soul, the energy, the natural energy of the person comes up. So we say in Krosa, umoya pansi okanya umoya pezulu. So umoya is, umoya means air, but it means soul. So the job of the Sangoma is to help the soul of the person come up. So we say, sifunungu umoya okuhamba pezulu. Sifunungu umoya so we're looking for the, the soul of the person to rise up so that their humanity is seen and so they connect with their natural born gifts as a human being, not as someone from cyberspace, not as like a zombie or someone who's just connected to something which is just very fleeting, like the ego or the personality as a human being connects to their soul and the essence of who they are, then they start making the correct decisions and then they start to connect with real magic. So if you're chanting, um, like you're probably familiar with, like we spoke about Ram Das and um, Krishna Das is part of the same school and Krishna Das is an incredible Kirtan musician and chanter. And if anyone is familiar with chanting, whether it's a yogic chanting or whether it's, it's Buddhist chanting, the resonances of the chanting in the voice just help you to drop into a space inside you. And that is also how your spirit comes up and it shows you where to go with your life. It shows you what your calling is and what your purpose is. And nowadays people are becoming very sick because they are connecting just with their personality and with the ego, and they think it's real. But it's not real. What's real is this deeper place inside of them, which is the soul, which is the spirit. And it's often that part of, of the person that is harder for people to identify with because they need to be a little bit quieter. And it's a quieter space inside of them. And when they go into those quieter places, then the soul rises. Mm -hmm. So now do the the dreams that they receive when they're in that state of resonance, are those, do you feel, coming from the soul as a way of communication or guidance? Yes, 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 that's right, yes. And that's when the journey starts. The journey only starts for a person once they're connecting with their umoya, the spirit inside of them. Then the journey starts. And I'm not going to say the journey is going to be easy then, no, but it's going to be very rich and very magical. But be aware of being uncomfortable. If you're feeling uncomfortable, wonderful. Then you really are connecting to your spirit. If you're feeling blissed out, wonderful. If you're not feeling anything, then you're not connecting to your spirit yet. Mm -hmm. I like how you mentioned Krishna Das as well. I think I'll include some of his videos and links in the description of this episode for anyone that's listening that's not familiar with Krishna Das. I do really like some of his chants, especially his uh, Hanuman Chalisa. Mm. Um, I, I sometimes I'll go and I'll play that for a week straight. I wake up and I'll play it for hours every morning because it, it does bring me into that state of resonance and it does sort of reveal my, my own truth to me. Um, and it sometimes feels very powerful, very overwhelming. And I find the ego to be such an interesting, uh, I guess, personality, the way it almost wants to cling and grasp even at that. 
it's almost like that will arise, this, this, this truth or, or this essence of being, and it, the ego wants to even attach or associate itself to that, which I, I find very interesting when I experience it. Um, now, you mentioned Zen as well, and, and listening to your, uh, your audio learning course, I, I caught that you had mentioned, it's almost like a Zen koan of one trying to consider or contemplate their original face before they were born. Uh, and it's also uh, been said as the original face even before your parents were born, which can bring someone even deeper into, into that state of thinking. You know, I've had, uh, I wanted to share a story with you. I had a, um, a DMT experience, like dimethyltryptamine, where you, you smoke it and, and you, you can have hallucinations or all sorts of different stuff. And I contemplated this idea, this notion of original face um, or original face of suchness, which is uh, like a Mahayana concept of, of, of this idea. And when I came out of this uh, experience, it was about 10, 15 minutes, I came out of it and, and it was being communicated me, to me that my original face is their original face of suchness, is the other. And it, 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 it completely like washed away the notion of separateness, even at the soul plane. So I just wanted to get your opinion on that, in, in that we are not necessarily just connected, we're connected at all levels, all layers of being. And I felt this very heavily, because I was sitting in a room with some other people, and I was looking at them, and I was being told, like, your face is their face. If there's no difference there, there's no separation. So I just wanted to get your take on that, that individual experience I had, because I, I found it to be very enlightening for uh, when I came out of that in terms of just removing or lifting the veil of, of separation. Yeah, I mean, you know, this this earth realm and this world we're living in is so magical. You know, it's so, it, you know, my Zen master used to say, there's everything in this world. There's this world can be nirvana. It can be the hell realm. It could be the heaven realm. It's, it all depends on on what's happening to you, to your mind. How is your mind right now, you know? How is your spirit right now? And also to teach people that they have the control. People think they don't have control, that they, that they are just imprisoned by politics and by demigods in their world that are telling them what to do. But once you start to really connect with your spirit, you start to see that this earth realm is all about relationship. And the first thing we have to do is come into relationship with ourselves. And once you start to feel that sense of connection with your own spirit and with nature, then you get to see there's such a similarity between you and other people that really is just the skin. It's just this little veneer of skin that makes us look different, but we are so similar. It's incredible. So I agree with what you're saying there, Adam, you know, when I've gone to deeper places and then come out of those places, um, there's such similarity between people. It's, it's, it's incredible. And, and I noticed this, especially in my training and apprenticeship in South Africa, I, I was in the rural areas and the townships and I was the only white guy, only white skinned guy around for about 20 kilometers. You know, all my friends spoke another language. They didn't speak Prosa. I mean, they didn't speak English. They spoke Prosa. They had a beautiful black skin and mine was the opposite white. But when I went into trance and I was dancing and singing with them, I would have these visions where I didn't look like this, where I was black, the same as them, exactly the same. And when I came out of those spaces, my friends around me, they didn't treat me like I was different. I was just the same as them. And the more I trained and the more I apprenticed and spent time with my teacher and my Kosa community, I got to feel such joy, but also such grief because in South Africa, we had such a, a civil war based on separation between people, and that's what's called apartheid. And that, that is actually an illusion. There's no separation. People are so similar. And it's such grief came up for me when I saw how similar we all are and also how ignorant and silly we are to make out that we are so different. And as human beings are fighting with, with each other right now, as human beings are fighting, Nature is dying. So part of my work is Ubuntu, which means humanity, is actually for human beings to sit in a circle and to stop fighting and actually turn outwards and look at the natural world, which is dying right now, and saying, what can we do? 
let's come together as a human family because we all have red blood and let's help Let's go and help the chipmunks outside who are struggling. Let's go and help the squirrels outside. Let's go and help the one-legged pigeons that are dying because of pesticides. Let's go and help the bees because the bees are dying because of pesticides. Let's stop fighting with each other and start helping the world around us. Because human beings, when you start going into a meditation state and you chant and you sing and you feel the joy in your heart, Human beings are very similar. We're all very, very similar. <laughs> yeah. And do you feel that the heart is a gateway to that? Yes. Yes, the heart. And not just the idea in the mind about the heart, but literally feeling that physical, visceral heartbeat, little drummer in your chest, feeling the pulse in your chest. And when you're doing that and you're hearing someone chant like Krishna Das and you're hearing the sound of the drum beat and your heart takes on the same rhythm as the drum beat, and then your mind starts to cool down and it starts connecting with your chest and with, there's a portal inside the heart. There's a portal inside our own physical hearts that connects us to our immortality, that connects us to our soul. And mystics and saints and yogis and shamans for thousands of years have spoken about this, mystical portal inside the physical heart that connects you with everything and that is the focus of my work mm -hmm. it's very interesting are, are you at all uh, versed or familiar with uh, egyptian ancient egyptian uh, they very much valued the heart to the, to the degree that you're describing even during their their mummification process they would rip out the brain through the nose basically discard it you know it's, it's not relevant at all but value the heart so much because it's brought with them to the next world mm. and they use the heart as the gateway or as a, basically the, what you would consider the eye, eye of the soul, even you could say, but it's, it's contained within the heart and uh, they put so much value in that. So I just wonder if you, if you have any personal interest in uh, Egyptian mythologies or uh, just ancient Egyptian uh, scriptures or anything like that. It seems very familiar that uh, you're passionate about the heart. Um, no, I haven't studied ancient Egyptian ways. I mean, I've looked into it a little bit, and it's quite similar. There is some similarity in Southern Africa, and um, but it's also different. But, yeah, the similarity in terms of the heart. Mm -hmm. I think when you go to deeper states of consciousness and meditation, and whether it's through Zen or through Buddhism or through dancing or through yoga, everything becomes very similar. Mm -hmm. um, so my sense of the heartbeat and connecting with the heartbeat and then connecting with the spine and the kundalini, it's, it's the same for my friends in India who are connecting with their yoga practice, whereas I'm connecting with my practice as a Sangwoma. So I'm an African yogi. But when we are connecting with our hearts and we're connecting with our feet and we're connecting with our spines, that mystical energy and information that comes into all of us. Mm -hmm. So do you find, I just want to get your opinion on it, do you think that there is almost too many different modalities to accessing this, this power that's contained within, within the heart? Because it, it, as you mentioned there, as you alluded to, there's just so many different practices that, that one can take on. I almost wonder if that's a hindrance in, in some regard because they're just, there's so much. And there's just, I find that even when I just deal with social media, people messaging me, I get messages and they'll ask something about this lineage and this practice and this practice and, this, and they just don't know. It's almost like just jumbled up to them. It's not really presented in, in a nice, clean, tidy way. So I find that a lot of people just get lost in the information, lost in all the different practices, and they just can't really. But then on, on the flip side, a lot of people are drawn specifically to one thing, in your case, obviously. Um, but do you think that there are almost too many different practices, but they do share similarities? So want to get your take on that no no i don't think so what i do think is that human beings need to choose one or two practices and focus on them so it's always a concern for me when people come to my workshops and then they do a lot of what's called spiritual shopping so they'll do and then it becomes a another kind of consumerism where they're looking for an experience and what it feeds is the hungry ghost energy inside of them and that hungry ghost energy is always feeding, always consuming. 
and it's just touching the surface. It's not touching the soul. So we always say um, in the Zen circles, my Zen master used to say to us, when you find one teacher where the medicine flows, stick with them. Stick with that way. Um, and if there's another way, another path which is similar, then you can incorporate that. But don't, don't walk many different paths because all the paths lead up the mountain. All the paths lead up the mountain. And if you keep starting a different path, you're never going to get up the mountain. So these are the ancient teachings. And if you look at the Buddha, and a lot of people in the West are familiar with Buddhism. Now, the Buddha taught 2,000 different techniques and trainings. And when someone asked why he did that, he said it's because the human mind and the human karma is such that people have different aptitudes and different abilities. However, it's up to the individual to find that one particular practice or, or a few different practices that are complementary that work for them. If they keep shopping, they're going to keep walking up that mountain their entire life and maybe the next life and the next life. But if they focus on one or two or maybe even three complementary paths that are very similar, they will get up that mountain, they'll make progress. It's a bit like, um, uh, you might be familiar with this, with a physical body, Adam, you know, personal training. I've, been, I've just started working with a personal trainer. And if you try all different techniques, but you just, you don't put your focus on one technique in terms of building the body, you, you're going to get dissipated. You're not going to put on muscle. You're going to keep, you're going to keep losing your energy. You're not going to... Um, you're not going to lose weight like you want to. You're going to keep struggling. But if you just focus on one or two um, cardiovascular techniques or body, um, you know, like gym techniques or programs, you're going to make a lot more um, strides. You're going, to, you're going to, your body's going to change. It's going to transform. So it's, it's a similar kind of thing in all different facets of life. If your mind keeps changing and starting something new, you're not going to make progress. It's the same with relationships. If you're looking for a relationship with a woman and as soon as things get difficult, you go to another girlfriend or another person, you're only going to have trivial and superficial relationships and you're never going to go deeper because you keep looking for a high, you keep looking for that good experience. So this speaks about addiction. It speaks about people addicted to new things because they're looking for a bit of a high and they're looking to feel good the whole time. But here's the thing. When you're working with the soul, if you're always looking to feel good, you're not connecting with the soul. You're connecting with addiction. But when, you, when you're connecting with your soul and you're not afraid of feeling uncomfortable, when you're not afraid of all the different likes and dislikes that come up, then you start to transform. Mm -hmm. that, that's really nice. I, I like how you, you spoke on uh, dating and people's relationships. I did cover that in, a, in another episode with someone where we were discussing just this uh, generation of people using dating apps and just swiping, you know, and yeah. just feeding that addiction. Exactly it. Right? It's everywhere. And, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in spirituality. It's in food. It's, it's consumerism. We're in a state in the human race of massive consumerism in every aspect of life. And what is that massive consumerism? And what we say in Buddhism is hungry ghost energy. Hungry ghost energy where people are consuming, they become like viruses, but they are not connected to their human spirit because if they were, they wouldn't feel the urge to want to consume so much. Mm -hmm. Everything would always be there for them at all times, yeah. Well, they'd feel, they'd feel nourished because when you're connecting to something inside of you, your heart beats, you feel a sense of peace. You might feel grief. You might feel sadness and shadow energy because that's all part of the soul. But you're not going to feel like you have to keep consuming in a rampant, viral kind of way. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, so I just don't want to shift, uh, shift gears here really quickly because I noticed, um, well, I saw that you noticed that I put a story on Instagram earlier because I wanted to see if anyone had any questions for you on the fly. So I did uh, have a question here uh, from Mr. Ash, and uh, he was asking how to travel in time in unconscious sleep. 
Well, I guess it's in relation to the sleep stages and, and the dream state and, and time. So do you, um, do you have anything for him, for Mr. Ash here? What's to say again? <laughs> yeah, he was asking how to travel in time in unconscious sleep. How to travel in time in unconscious sleep. You know how you interpret that is entirely up to you, but that's all I got in terms of the question. And I'm, not, I'm asking that one because some of the other ones were a little silly. So I'm going to go with that one for now, and then we'll see if anyone else shoots something in. But, yeah, well, what is your it's take? Like, on it's like saying, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. I, could ask, I could ask Mr. Ash another question, and that is, do ducks fly in a straight line? Okay, okay. <laughs> Very nice. Um, actually, it's funny, one of the other questions was uh, in relation to dating, and it's, uh, that's actually, I got quite a few of that, people asking about relationships and whatnot, so I think what we just covered is going to be pretty helpful for a lot of people in that sense. The uh, first but, relationship that's most important, Adam, the first relationship people need to cultivate is the relationship with their own soul, their yeah. own spirit. And that is the relationship that everyone is afraid to develop, but we as a human race have a responsibility to develop a relationship with our souls, because if we don't, we're going to destroy this world. Mm. And do you think that a lot of people are just seeking those partners that are going to give them that connection that yes. is within? They're just constantly out seeking for some other individual to bring that to them? What it is, is what is titillation. Titillation meaning that people are looking for that, that feel good factor, which is, which is promoted in social media. And it's all about focusing on the superficial, focusing on the personality, on the ego, because people are afraid. They are afraid to feel a deeper part of themselves. They're afraid of their spirit. There's nothing to be afraid of. Good and bad, coming and going, life and death. Feel the depth of your spirit and know that once you do, you can feel like a wealthy person. And when you feel your spirit and soul and you can smile at that connection, then any relationship with anyone else becomes much easier. Mm -hmm. And probably much more enriched as well and you can help be in that space with other individuals and help mm -hmm. bring them into that resonance as well. You know, I suppose you're much more of a powerful manifester in that sense. I know a lot of people are very into law of attraction and manifesting and this and that. So I think that what you're saying is that the true root of manifestation and, and law of attraction and, and drawing in that energy is to first find it within yourself and then uh, help others as well. Yeah, and I think, I mean, on this point of, of a relationship, it's very raw and it's very personal and there's lots of pain in that area and it's very beautiful. And there's something about, about that energy of looking for the other, looking for the other, uh, maybe it's a physical looking or is a sense of yearning, is a sense of feeling lonely inside yourself. But once you stop feeling needy, once that neediness goes, suddenly you become very attractive to the other. Mm -hmm. So we all know if there's someone who's very needy in your peripheries, whether it's a friend who wants to hang out with you, or maybe someone who wants to date you and they're really needy, there's nothing more off-putting. You you, you, you'll be friendly with them, you'll be polite, and you'll be kind, but you want to get away from them. But when someone is feeling confident because they're connecting to their spirit inside of them, they don't give off this needy energy because they feel, you feel a sense of peace around them because they are connecting to their own spirit. Then everyone wants to be with them. It's the craziest thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. everyone Like, gets like it Ram Dass. Like, uh, you know, yeah, Ram say, yeah. Much like Ram Dass. You know, yeah. when I spoke to him, we were, we must've spent about half the call in silence. Yeah. Absolute silence. And we were just smiling and just enjoying each other and uh, I, I started to even get emotional just just sitting there in silence with him it was amazing and at the at the end of the call we just ended with i love you back and forth and that was it it was uh it's absolutely beautiful and it's when you're when you're in that state which you're describing there's no no words are even required you know it's 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 perfect yeah yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, my, that's, that's my wish, Adam, for people who are struggling in relationships, you know, is my heart goes out to them. And I've been in those places myself. And the first is just to accept that you're struggling and that you're looking for a lover, you're looking for a partner. And then look inside yourself 
and make peace with your own heartbeat and sing and chant to your own heartbeat and listen to it, listen to it. And as you do that, you start to heal that neediness and that trauma inside of you. And then things in the outer world will start to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, now might be a good time. And uh, I kind of gave you a heads up that I'd be asking you to, to lead a little bit of a chant for anyone here that's, that's listening. Uh, and I'll include a link directly to this portion of the episode so people can always go back to it if they just want to use it as a resource. But do you mind just uh, leading a little bit of a chant for uh, anyone that may be experiencing some, some difficulties or some trauma that they're overcoming? But I really like the, the chance you do around strengthening uh, oneself. So, uh, but anything you're open to, uh, I'd really appreciate it. And I'm sure anyone that's listening would as well. Yeah, sure. And I mean, I, I, I'd love to do that. So I think um, the chanting is a good way to bring ourselves into alignment with our own spirit. And, and I just encourage the listener, wherever they are, to just drop in, close your eyes and just drop into your heartbeat. And to just feel, feel your own heartbeat, feel the resonance in your chest. And be compassionate and kind to yourself. So don't beat yourself up. Just take a nice deep breath into your heart and feel your physical heart beat. Feel your heart beat. And breathing in a little bit deeper. Breathing into the spaces between each heartbeat.
So I'm calling on the great spirit and all our ancestors and I'm calling on the great mother, Umamankulu, Ukusondela, to come closer to us so that we can feel the vibration of this human birth, so that can, we can feel what our calling is in this life, Siddhikamaku, which means namaste and kosa. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Very nice. So do you typically do that type of chant at a workshop for people? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these people call these workshops, but what I do is more, it's not really a workshop, it's more of a ceremony. So I suppose the yoga language is better. It's more like a satsang. Oh, okay. so I, I do more where I'm calling in the divine. The divine for us in, in Southern Africa has different names, but it's still the divine so it would be Izanyanya, Abazali, which mean our parents, um, the, the spirits of the other world, the nature spirits. So these are the names that I'd be using, and I'd be calling on the divine in African ways. And as I do that, I'm drumming and I'm singing and I'm whistling and I'm calling on these nature spirits to come and be with us. And then people receive dreams or different experiences. And my whole job is to go beyond the opposites of good and bad, the opposites of male and female, and to call in that other energy. Mm -hmm. Well, very nice. Well, thank you for that, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so we're coming up on just about an hour now, but uh, I did want to just give an opportunity to mention um, one of your books here, Leopard Warrior. So I'm gonna include the link to this as well in the description of this episode. Uh, but was there anything else you wanted to share with anyone? Any closing thoughts before we, we hop off? Also, the, the audio teachings. Mm -hmm. Yep, the audio teachings as well. Which, is it just the CD form or there's no, there's no MP3 version of this? Uh, people can download that um, from the Sounds True website and also from my website. And when they download it onto their, their phones, then there's yeah, MP3. Yeah. Okay, very nice. And are you working on any new books right now or any new projects? I'm working on a, on a second book now, actually, and it's got to do with the environment on the wilderness. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm busy with, with, a, with a very unusual retreat in the Kalahari, which I'm launching next year. And it's called Dreams and Tracking in the Kalahari. And it's basically a seven-day process where I'm taking people into the heart of the desert and I'm teaching them the way of the leopard, which is this indigenous way of connecting with our dreams and with our spirits. And then at the end, we're going to be joined by Kalahari San elders, Bushman elders, who have kept these old ways of tracking and connecting with environments and connecting with nature for hundreds and thousands of years. And they have a dying, that's a dying art of tracking and communicating with, with animals. And um, so I'm going to be teaching people animal communication with my colleague in, 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 in um, the Kalahari and the language of birds. And, uh, and that's forming my second book, which is working with nature and with the animal world. Because mm -hmm. as human beings fight, nature dies. And this is what's happening. So my whole focus now is let's just stop fighting as human beings and let's start loving each other and turning and holding hands and facing the natural world and let's start doing some good out there. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. And I will send you all of this, the links and everything once the episode goes live. But um, yeah, thank you again. And hopefully we can have another chat when your new book comes out. Uh, yeah. If people are interested in taking part um, in, in, that, in the tracking and, and all, is, is it on your website they can find uh, that information or? Uh, yes, can... yes, it's on my website. You just go to johnlockie.com. You'll see it on the home page at the top. It's dreams and tracking in the Kalahari. Okay, perfect. So I'll include that as well in, uh, in the video here. But uh, yeah. thank you again for taking the time. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Adam. Bye.